Hello and welcome to This Week in James City County. I'm your host, Renee Dolman. Today I am once again joined by Scott Stevens, County Administrator for James City County. Welcome, Scott. Hey, Renee. Great to be back. Uh, we were talking about how long it's been and I can't believe it. So it really is good to be back this time, Renee. Good. Well, February and March, I think both just went like that. I don't know how that happened. Yeah, it's been a really quick uh, few months. So anyway, but it's uh, always good to be here and share what's going on within the county and have the interaction with you and hopefully our citizens benefit from that and, and learn a little bit while we talk through some things. Absolutely. Well, it's been a busy couple of months, so I'm just going to let you take it away. <laughs> we'll, fight. we'll interject where needed because you're pretty good at keeping me on track and making sure things make sense to, to the community. Um, I do want to wish everybody a happy spring. It's here and it feels like spring. And so I'm, for me, I'm excited about that. I enjoy the warmer weather and I appreciate winter, but I really enjoy the spring and summer. And uh, for those that celebrate Easter, uh, it ought to be a good time uh, weather-wise for that as well. So we encourage people to get outside, move around. That's good for all of us at any age. And uh, um, enjoy what we have here. I do want to make uh, just a couple quick things before I get into sort of the normal board meeting uh, summaries. Uh, first, some staffing changes. Um, I, I'm not sure I shared here, but we have shared that our former chief of police, uh, Brad Reinheimer, uh, was selected as our to fill our new assistant county administrator position. And that happened back in January. So he's been in that role since then, which has left a, 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 us to uh, put um, our deputy chief, Steve Rubino, in as our interim chief. And so the department has been in good hands since Brad's departure. Um, but we are working through that process to find a permanent chief. And again, we're going to have an internal process. We've got a number of candidates that I feel are very qualified in terms of training and education and experience and knowing in the community and being here long term. Uh, and our hope is to have a permanent chief in place uh, by the June time frame. So Brad is really lead, leading that effort for us. There'll be some community involvement um, in terms of taking that through. It won't be dozens, but uh, some community members will be part of our assessment process. Uh, and we hope to be able to have an announcement of that, uh, like I said, by the June time frame. Uh, I've also reverted back to some things that I think Sandy Warner did when he was here as county administrator some years ago in swapping some of our executive leadership. And so uh, none of this is meant to be a permanent swap, but Jason Purse, who's my other assistant county administrator and been in that role a number of years, has temporarily switched position with John Carnifax, our Parks and Rec Director. So if you see Jason in a place or doing something that you've not seen him doing before, it's not meant to be permanent. I look forward to having him back in the mm -hmm. office. Uh, but he is functioning as our interim parks and rec director. And then John Carnifax uh, uh, is now a recreation director functioning as an interim uh, assistant county administrator. And I do want to thank both the gentlemen for stepping out and doing something that's probably a little confusing, a little uncomfortable, a little different. Uh, but the intent is to make it better for the organization, make the organization stronger by creating some more diversity and experiences within our executive leadership team. And so they've been doing that about a month. And they, I expect for them to continue that uh, through the August time frame, and then we'll rotate them back into their spots and see where we go from there. But the, again, just so folks know or wonder uh, what we're doing, that's what we're doing. Um, I do want to mention budget. We've been working pretty hard uh, for the last several months assembling budget, particularly our departments and our financial management services group. Our FY22 proposed budget uh, is out. And uh, so if you haven't had an opportunity to take a look at that, I would encourage you to do so. It is on our website. Uh, there is a public hearing on the budget April 13th at five o'clock. So if you have comments that you'd like to share with the Board of Supervisors, there are ways to do that in person and remotely, meaning you can email or leave a message, a phone message that we will share with the board. Uh, again, that public hearing is April 13th. We will meet with the Board of Supervisors uh, at their business meeting in April for a budget discussion. And that meeting, that's April 27th. Uh, it's a public meeting. There's not a public comment. Uh, but you're welcome to tune in. That meeting begins at one o'clock on April 27th, and you're welcome to listen to the budget discussion there. And my hope is that we will present it to the Board of Supervisors at their May 11th meeting and that they would consider adopting some version of what I have presented to them. So uh, that is our budget process, and we can talk more about that another day, but there's opportunity for those that want to learn about the budget or know what we're doing and why uh, uh, it's there. One thing I will mention, no tax rate increase, so nothing on personal or real property. That seems to be a concern to most. Uh, we are implementing or recommending that we implement a cigarette tax at 40 cent a pack. Um, so that is something that I hope will be effective July 1st. Most cities you know, throughout Virginia have that. 
uh, taxing authority and tax on their books. Uh, Williamsburg does. Most counties have not had that opportunity until now. So many of us are trying to take advantage of that as well. So that is the one significant difference in terms of revenue. And again, happy to talk more about the budget with anybody that has an interest at another time. We've talked a lot about vaccinations, at least uh, on a staff side. And Renee, you've been in the middle of that. We've been putting out very regular news releases, or you have, and information to the community. Uh, I just want to tell you that your county staff and your city staff with the city of Williamsburg and York as well have worked extremely hard uh, to make sure our citizens had access to a vaccination clinic. Uh, the doctor's hospitals or hospital healthcare systems, I think, have done a very good job as well of getting vaccines into uh, their patients. Um, there, in my opinion, the health department wasn't resourced well enough in terms of people uh, to get it all out as quickly as we had hoped. And so we did become, our board was concerned. We became very involved late December, early January. We stood up a clinic toward the end of January and have run that clinic every week since then. Um, staff with your EMTs, school nurses, some other volunteer nurses, some health department nurses, uh, I will tell you, it has really uh, been a joy to see the outcome of that effort. And, and we have been able to vaccinate or provide over 12,000 doses since we've opened the clinic. So we haven't provided, in James City County, there's over 42,000 doses that have been administered. We've done over 12,000 of those in our area through this clinic. And so I'm pretty excited that that's uh, been occurring and really happy with the partnership. Uh, with the city of Williamsburg, York County, and James City County. And, uh, you know, supply is increasing. As we started all of this process, um, we, were, we, being Virginia, we were getting about 100,000 doses per week in the early days. They're up to over half a million doses per week uh, as of this week. That is expected to continue to increase. We're moving through the phases, expect to be 1C sometime in April. Uh, and I, I believe based on conversations that anyone that wants to get a vaccination against COVID would have that opportunity over the summer. I don't know if that's the next two or three months or the next three to five, but I do believe by the end of summer, the vaccine supply will be enough that anybody that wants a vaccine will have been able to get that. And although that still seems like a long time, it really goes by fast and would just encourage all of us vaccinated or otherwise to please continue to follow the guidelines of wearing our masks and washing our hands and uh, social distancing and not being in too big of crowds, all those things we've been doing for the past, I guess, nine to 12 months, uh, we really need to continue much of that going forward. And there are um, relaxations by our governor in terms of gathering size. And I think, I hope my expectation is that will continue to relax as we go forward in time and the data and the caseload tends to drop. So don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but I am really encouraged by the vaccinations that are occurring, the, the cases that seem to be not as consistent and our positivity rate, which has been dropping. So I hope that those trends continue for us. Renee, you've been in the vaccination business or not vaccination, but the uh, following all the COVID trends. Is anything I've left out of that that you'd want to add to? Well, I think important for folks to know is to please go online and, or call. I, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but we'll have it at the end. Make sure you're on that list for the health department. A lot of the different vaccination clinics get their list from the health department. So it's very important that you're on that. And also answer your phone. I know that that's a pain sometimes when you don't know the number, but answer your phone and be sure to check your emails because there could always be an appointment request or reminder coming up and we don't want people to miss that, so. Right, and it is a confusing process. How do I get into CVS or Walgreens? And it's a different website that gives you a chance to those kind of things versus uh, the, the state health department's website versus our clinic and the emails that come out are coming from different sources and we all are suspicious. So right. to your point, if you have questions, Renee will provide the information at the end mm -hmm. of this and uh, would encourage you to keep trying. People are being vaccinated in our community. We are making progress. Uh, and you know, based on the VDH data, which I'm always a little suspicious of, James City County really is doing very well compared to all the other communities across Virginia. We seem to have a high percentage of our population who has been able to receive um, a first and or second dose. So again, I hope that trend continues, uh, but I do think it'll get easier and easier and easier to get a vaccine or a vaccination over the coming months. Um, in some of board meetings, since we, uh, the board's been meeting uh, on the regular schedule of a couple times a month plus, um, I guess I'll jump back to their February 9th meeting. Again, we had changed their meeting schedule, so they have a regular meeting at five o'clock um, at the first of the month, which is meant to be related to 
public comment, public hearings, and then they have a business meeting, late, their second meeting in the month, uh, which is really meant to at one o'clock, that's meant to do sort of county business. And so they've tried to accommodate the public and not have a lot of things ahead of the uh, public comment or presentations or, or public hearings. Um, so that that meeting, the first meeting each month is really dedicated to that. So February 9th, uh, their regular meeting at five o'clock, they had four public hearings, really development related. Uh, the two that had the most interest uh, was a rezoning at Colonial Heritage, which was denied. It was a change of the master plan and allowing some additional uh, units on less acreage and the board just didn't feel comfortable with that change. So that was not approved. And then the one that seemed to have significant support was a drive through for Brewster's Real Ice Cream. So that is something that the board did approve and that'll be incumbent upon Brewster's if they wanna move forward with that. So that was the most of their February 9th meeting. Their February 23rd business meeting, again at one o'clock, a number of contract awards, primarily waste industries uh, related to, I believe our transfer station and the handling of our solid waste for county residents. Um, and then Jolly Pond Road, we had closed the road there at the dam a few years ago due to safety concerns with the dam. Uh, we have now uh, finished some design work related to a better turnarounds. We've sort of let people have to sort of figure it out. We are going to create, uh, they aren't cul-de-sacs, but a way that if you get to the end of the road, there is a paved area where most vehicles will be able to make a turn and go back the other direction. And then we had some stormwater facilities uh, well, projects being awarded as well. So that was their February business meeting. They moved into their March 9th regular meeting. Again, they had five public hearings. Uh, several of those public hearings were just cleaning up some county code language, trying to make it clearer or update it to whatever the current standard might be. There was one public hearing related to amending the WISC lease that we have at Warhill, where WISC has the uh, indoor facilities and the pool. Uh, they were requesting that we split those so that WISC would maintain responsibilities for the main building that they built some years ago and that they would turn over the responsibilities to the pool and really ownership of the pool to 757 Swim Club. The board did approve that lease, so we'll see where they go from that. But I think that was intended. Both groups seem to be excited about that possibility of having a better use of the pool for our expectations, both the public and uh, the 757 swim team, and then let WISC concentrate more on their core mission. So uh, that was their main action March 9th. They did hold a joint meeting um, with the Williamsburg James City County School Board and the Williamsburg City Council. Uh, really, the purpose of that joint meeting in the spring is to hear the school's operating budget presentation. So that was the bulk of that meeting that occurred on March 12th. Uh, and then their meeting uh, March 23rd, their business meeting again at one o'clock, uh, had a number of presentations. <clears throat> the first being the Historical Commission awarded uh, Mr. John um, LeBanish posthumously the Historic Preservation Award. His wife uh, accepted on his behalf. Uh, he's put a lot of years into this community. And I think it was very appropriate that the Historical Commission recognized his service to the community. And we have many volunteers that work on a number of boards. I do want to say thank you to all of you. We don't always get the recognition to you that probably you deserve for your time and effort, but it does make a difference in your advice and uh, what the board, they, they do appreciate your service to this community. So I do want to congratulate uh, Mr. Labanish and um, again, others that are out there working on behalf of, of the county and our citizens. I would just say thank you. Uh, we also had a presentation um, and a, a proclamation for April being recognized as Child Abuse Prevention Month, really led by folks from our social service department, our police department, and our parks and rec department. Uh, you'll start to see the blue pinwheels out there. And really child abuse is one of those things we all need to be aware of all the time and try to work to prevent that. But April is the month of focus nationally. And so you'll see more about that in April. And we just encourage all of us to become more aware and educated on how we help uh, to prevent children within our community that sometimes we see and don't pay attention to that really need some other adult to step in and help. So um, more to come on that. Uh, we also had a presentation from uh, Bob Crum, our uh, Hampton Roads Planning District Commission Executive Director, talking about the birthplace of America bike trail. And really it's meant to be an extension of the Capitol Trail that runs from Richmond to, to James City County. There's another plan with this birthplace of America trail to extend it on down through Hampton Roads. Uh, the idea presented and is there's some opportunities and other communities working on segments of that trail of connecting it to the Capitol Trail, which would put James City County sort of in the middle 
of this 120 some mile trail really could be something that another 10 or 15 years uh, folks would back bike from Richmond to here and spend some time here and hopefully leave some money while they're enjoying the area and then bike back to Richmond or vice versa from Hampton come to here. Uh, and so I think it has some real opportunity to make us uh, one of those biking areas uh, that all of the country comes to. I mean, it's not, not very many places where you can have a hundred plus mile of off-road trail that goes through places that have things to see and the history that we have and other amenities to enjoy. So I think that's a pretty exciting project and was just presenting to the board uh, for information as much as anything. So they're sort of aware there's some activity around that. Uh, we do have VDOT uh, stepping up and I want to thank them with a couple hundred thousand dollars of money for planning efforts that gets, uh, there was a very high level plan done some years ago this additional money would look at some specific segments and try to figure out how do we move some of those uh, specific pieces forward and, and, and start connecting them together. So a uh, pretty exciting project for those that enjoy those types of things. Um, Rossi Carroll with VDOT uh, came in and did a quarterly update for the board. I've got one, he had a lot of information to share on resurfacing and other projects that are going on. I'll have one in a minute I want to talk about with us some traffic changes to Route 5 at Centerville and um, Route 30 at Old Stage Road. So I'll follow that up in a minute so I can and talk in a little more detail. And then we had a briefing on our 2045 comp plan update. Um, we've had a lot of public input over the last year and a half to two years. We do expect to complete the process this summer. So uh, if you want your final comments or say, it's time to uh, make sure you're there. But uh, we have had uh, what we feel is good public input. So I want to thank all of those who've taken time to participate in that. Your, your input does matter. It sort of shapes our recommendations to the board and what the community may look like as things develop over the next 20 years. So that should be back to the board in the coming months and then it hopefully adopted over the summer. Uh, at their March 23rd meeting, they also awarded a contract to replace our fire boat. Uh, I think it's a 20 plus year old uh, boat uh, that we were replacing. It does come with a 75% port grant. So while the boat's about a $400,000 expenditure uh, so that we can respond to rescue and recovery type things, as well as to help um, with fires that may work on any cargo moving up and down the river or anything else that would occur, uh, the port grant helps support the, the cost of that boat. So we were pleased with that and have awarded that contract. Uh, they approved, the board approved a scattered site housing application where we're putting up $300,000 in, in hopes of getting $700,000 in CDBG money. Uh, to really help go in and help renovate some homes that are really in structurally poor condition. And so they will be throughout the county. We also awarded a contract that changes our 457-401k plan administrator for the county. Uh, we made minor modifications to an easement on Forge Road, trying to protect the view shed, but allowing some horse facilities within that four and 800 foot uh, setback that we had approved some time ago. And then they authorized Parks and Recreation to apply for funds uh, in hopes of getting a grant to purchase future park property in the lower part of our county. It's a park we've talked about for a number of years. I believe the county will figure out how to fund it regardless of whether we receive the grant or not. But if we can take, um, if we can use outside funding to purchase uh, park property or amenities for our community, it's always uh, good for us to do that. And I commend our staff for being aware of what's out there and working through that. And so I think for the last two months, that's the short summary of what the board had uh, approved or talked through. Um, and I appreciate Renee, you let me share that without a whole lot of interruptions. So thank you. Good. <laughs> you, for that. Um, you know, a couple other things I would just mention that are just probably a little more visible to people. Uh, for those interested in the Marina project, we do have a project that's replacing uh, the, the boat slips, not the covered boat storage, resurfacing, removing uh, the overhead electric, uh, adding some, some walking areas, moving the kayaks and canoe segments from out from the Marina Basin over to the sort of side channel. So they're separate from most of the boat traffic, at least around the Marina. We have dredged the Marina. Well, our contractor is a little behind. There's been some issues. He's done the dredging. Like I said, the electric lines have been removed. Um, the project has run into some issues where they were trying to build the living shoreline and when they would put the new soil in, what they called a mudway, but it was some of the silt that was would push out and create some other issues. And they've been working through some solutions for that the last month or two. So if you've been out there and wonder, well, darn, they haven't been working, that's the delay. Uh, we are still working with our contractor and are hopeful that they will have a significant part of it done by the Memorial Day timeframe. That's what we originally had discussed with them and they felt like they could make that. So we'll see. Um, we don't have a project schedule yet with this uh, working through the, the current issue, but we are talking with the contractor and hope to have more to be able to share. Had a number of conversation about what are we doing over at the Jamestown Beach Event Park. 
people see all this dirt that's being disturbed out on the field that has typically been used for parking uh, when we had the Jamestown uh, jams. And so uh, that parking area is not where the disturbed area really isn't disturbed. It's been where the spoils have gone from the dredging. So we've we, we put silt fence around it, took off the topsoil, have carried the dredged material over there, the intents to let it dry out, put the topsoil back on it, grow grass. So eventually it will be a field again. So there's not a building project today occurring on that property, but we have had a number of converse, uh, comments about that and questions about that. So if you haven't heard, that's what's going on there. Um, it has been a very wet winter. Um, I think we could say that other times as well, but this has been an extremely wet winter. And just for those out there, we have had a number of stormwater related issues. And so if you have things that are going on that seem to be extreme, I do think that will get better. If you think there are areas where the county or VDOT could be involved, I would encourage you to call us and we will try to work through uh, situations that you may be experiencing that maybe you haven't experienced before because of the volume and the amount of uh, moisture in the soil that just hadn't um, well, it's created some problems on the surface that maybe we haven't normally seen because it has been a very wet spring. Um, I, I said I would mention VDOT. I do want to come back to Route 5 at Centerville. Uh, VDOT should have is installing um, a right in, right out from Centerville onto Route 5. And the rationale behind that is we, we had a lot of uh, discussion with the neighborhood out there and community members about safety concerns along Route 5 between Green Springs Road and Centerville. Uh, a number of very bad accidents, uh, a, a number of accidents, maybe not as bad, but it's just a, a higher accident uh, rate than the residents wanted. And so VDOT has done a number of safety analysis out there. Two things that were sort of short-term solutions, and one was reducing speed limit along Route 5, which is being done to 35 miles per hour um, from west of Green Springs to east of Centerville. Now, so that section will be reduced to 35 miles per hour, <clears throat> trying to slow people down so they have more time to react to what's going on. There's a lot of traffic through there, a lot of left turn moments off of Route 5. When they looked at the accident history, there were more accidents occurring down at the Centerville Road. So by making that a right in, right out, uh, it will eliminate the left turns uh, from uh, Route 5 onto Centerville or from Centerville onto Route 5. And yes, that will be inconvenient for some. It adds uh, a couple miles, a mile and a half, I think, to the travel time or to your trip if you were usually uh, turning on Centerville Road. But the intent is to make it safer. And so that is short term, um, a much uh, safer movement and at a very reasonable cost. The longer term plan is to try to figure out, and we have talked with VDOT about this, how to align Green Springs Road with Centerville so that you eliminate those offset left turn movements altogether. And that is a future project. So I think that will occur, but today funding has not been identified and it's a very expensive project. It's not a, you know, it's multi-million dollars to be able to make that um, change. And so I think long-term that will be where they're headed. VDOT is putting these in to see if it does improve the accident rate there. So they, they're meant to be uh, temporary before there's something more permanent. And saying that they are painting them in so they'll visually be there and then putting traffic delineators, a little three or four foot post that you see to sort of force you to go the right directions. It does allow for our fire trucks that might be responding uh, that need to make a left turn, will be able to make a left turn for safety or for uh, life safety kinds of things. But that is what's going on there. There was a public meeting uh, with the community to talk about issues overall. And then when VDOT had done their safety uh, study, they did come back and we held another public meeting. So there was some opportunity there for public input. And I hope the residents will um, appreciate the changes, at least uh, even though they're inconvenient for some, uh, the intent is to make it safer for them and their families that travel through those areas on a regular basis. The other area where VDOT is doing something similar uh, is over on Old Stage and Route 30 near the schools. Uh, we have had a lot of comp concern from parents who were going to uh, drop their kids off or pick their kids up and near misses they were seeing. And VDOT has spent a lot of time looking at that intersection as well. It is fairly wide open. Um, it's, it is a 35 mile per hour speed zone during school hours. Uh, what they found is when they looked at the, the accidents history most of the accidents weren't occurring during the peak school time. So while there were some accidents, really accidents were occurring at that intersection, um, most of the time not during those peaks. Uh, and when they looked at where the accidents were coming from, more than 50% were people making a left turn from old stage onto Route 30. So more than 50% of the accidents. And then of those accidents, 
they accounted for about 70 some percent of the serious injuries. So VDOT looked at that and is proposing a right out. So you will, coming out of old stage, you will not be able to go straight or turn left. Same thing, it's temporary. It will be painted in with the delineator post and the intent is to make you turn right and then you have to do a U-turn. So they've improved the U-turn, which you can see as you make the right turn. And by doing that, they're hopeful that they will address the 70% uh, or more of the injuries that are occurring there and more than 50% of the accidents by just that one fairly simple movement. Yes, it's inconvenient, but the overall travel time for residents probably doesn't increase more than 60 seconds. Um, it's not much in the way of distance. Um, and certainly when um, I think it ought, the DeVDOT's analysis was during busy times where it's hard to turn left, you almost get through the intersection quicker by turning right and then making a U-turn and coming back because you're not having to wait for the traffic to sync up with a break in traffic to get across. So I do ask for patience with residents there. I know those kinds of things are frustrating and inconvenient, uh, but the intent is to make it safer for, again, for you and families and others that are moving through that intersection. Um, and Renee, I think that's getting pretty close to the end. I, you know, we talked a little bit about things getting back to normal or getting better. Um, I will say I'm really pleased that Bush Gardens has continued to be able to operate. They've worked when there was a thousand patrons in the park. It moved to 4,000. Their capacity continues to increase based on the governor's guidance and trying to work within that. Uh, I'm really excited that they have continued to operate almost every weekend this year, which has been unusual for them. I've talked with their park president. Uh, they believe things will get better for them this spring. And uh, and I will tell you, I've been there a number of times myself. It is was really um, strange to be in the park with only a thousand other people. It just, even when they only had portions of the park open, I appreciated them being open, but it just felt deserted. And so it, when I know when they moved to 4,000, I was back there a few times, it felt better. Uh, but they do have a lot of safety measures in place. There was never a time where I felt like there were too many people around or I was in too bit of, big of a crowd. So I think they've done a really good job trying to make it a safe experience and, and pleasant one for people visiting. And I certainly am encouraged and hopeful their capacity will continue to increase because not only does it have an impact for them, but it impacts the businesses around them from our hotels to our restaurants, uh, to our retail stores in and around. And all of those have really suffered significantly these past uh, uh, 12 months. And so I'm hopeful the next 12 months is better for not only Bush Gardens, but for all those secondary businesses that benefit from the folks that visit here as well. And you know, I want us to all be safe. I want it to, um, uh, want us all to make it through this, but at the same time, I want our businesses uh, to get through it as well. You know, I haven't talked about county finances too much this time in terms of COVID and its impact, but I will tell you our sales tax number, which is a big part uh, of our budget, has held very well, much better than we budgeted for. Our meals and hotels or occupancy taxes are much less or, or significantly less than they've been in years past. So that's how I know some of those businesses are struggling. Uh, but overall, your county finances, we are doing very well. We have watched our expenditures, our revenues have held to our budget. And then the CARES Act and this American Rescue Plan money that are coming has only made that better, at least in the short term, in terms of county finances and being able to provide services. So uh, I do worry about our, some of our business community, um, but from the county government side, we're in, in very good shape today. So, and if that were to change, we would share that with our board and the community as well. So I think I'll end where I started to say, you know, I, I wish everybody a uh, uh, happy Easter, enjoy the spring. Uh, it's a great time to get outside. I'll be outside doing a little more walking, maybe not running, uh, but uh, walking and biking. And I look forward to being able to get back on the water some, but uh, this time of year, I really enjoy and I hope you're able to take advantage of that as well. So with that, I'll kick it back over to you, Renee. All right. Well, as always, you've done an incredible job. I don't need, I have nothing to add. I mean, you've taken <laughs> care of all of it. Well, I'll leave some out next time so you can fill in. How about oh, that? Oh, that would be great. Thank you. Thank You're you. I guess I did just come up with one thing to right. add. Um, building on what you were saying about businesses struggling, there is assistance available. And so if you are struggling, whether it's your business or your family, please reach out because our social services office, our economic development office, I know that the help is available. There is. And I think even as part, well, we don't know all the details of the new funding that was just passed by Congress under the American Rescue Plan. My, my summary of some information I read had talked about there being some more money for businesses. And so 
if there's a thought out there in the business community of what would really make a difference and how do we target, target the right sectors? You know, we did a business grant. We mm -hmm. put half a million dollars out there. About 400,000 of that was used by our business community. We're trying to figure out how to spend that last hundred thousand dollars back to the businesses that need it. Uh, but I think we would want to hear from you if there are ways you think that we should put that money out and target uh, those businesses that really are suffering. How do we figure who out exactly who they are and how we make it sort of a fair and equitable thing that might make a difference to help them through this tough time. So uh, we'd be open to that discussion. Um, we don't have a, a fixed plan in place yet. Uh, and as we have more details of the funding that's coming, I will have more opportunity to talk. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Scott, as always. Great Thanks job. You, Renee. Yeah. And I would tell folks, you know, if you have a question, and you don't know who to call, call me. I may yeah. not be the right person, but I can get you to wherever you need to go. And, and my number, uh, 757-253-6603. I'm happy to talk to whomever uh, has a question. And if I'm not the right person to speak with, I can get you to the person within our county organization who would be. So look forward to talking to you. All right. Thanks so much, Scott. Well, that wraps up this episode of This Week in James City County. Thank you so much for tuning in. As always, please continue to wear your mask and practice social distancing when you can. And, you know, go on the website. We're at jamescitycountyva.gov slash podcast. While there, you're going to find all of our episodes as well as a form. And we would really like to get feedback. Give us comments, critiques, show ideas, guest ideas. We would love to hear from you. So once again, thank you so much for tuning in and we will talk with you next time.